It's Meet the Writers on BarnesandNoble.com. I'm Steve Bertrand. I became a writer the way other people become a nun or a monk. I took a vocation, and I started very early. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Elizabeth Gilbert. She joins us now. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Is, is writing something you could not do? Could you not be a writer now? No, I don't think so. I, I actually had to give it a little bit of thought after Eat, Pray, Love came mm-hmm. out, and um, and it, it took me about a year to get back into writing, and I actually thought, well, maybe I'm done, right? You know, maybe the purpose of the 20 years of effort that I put into this was to write this book that everyone seems to care about so much, and maybe now I can go sell shoes or something. Um, but no, I'm a few months away from it, and uh, there was no doubt. Came right back to had you. To, had to come back. It's an interesting career because it's t- it's been two-tiered so far, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you were a successful writer before Eat, Pray, Love, and then things took off. Yeah, and then there's a whole different thing that happened, yeah. the, the what, weird stratification of have, uh, it, it, Tell me about the difference between the two. Um, well, it's sort of the difference between night and day, I guess. You know, um, the, you know I, had a, I had a steady career going that I'd been building up for a long time as a journalist, um, which was my bread and butter um, sort of industry, mm-hmm. you know, working for magazines and stuff, and then on the side, writing the books that I really cared about. Um, and then, you yeah, know, I went through this bad divorce, and I had a kind of nervous breakdown, and I went and traveled around the world, and I wrote this memoir about it, which I honestly thought was kind of just a pause in my career. You know, I sort of thought, okay, well, I hope everyone will forgive me that I have to go do this um, and write this book that I'm really going to be the only person who cares about, and then I'll get back to doing the stuff everybody would prefer me to be doing, Right. um, which, of course, did not turn out to be the case. I'm interested in the story of Sternman, because you wrote it before Eat, Pray, Love, Yeah. right? And so you have these great self-realizations during your trip, Mm -hmm. right, while you're writing Eat, Pray, Love, Mm -hmm. and then you come back and release a book that you've written in your Uh pre-self. Do you read yourself differently? Yeah, yeah, actually, you know, I hadn't read it. It's it's funny because you, you know, my friend Ann Patchett says, I am fascinated by my books exactly until the moment they are published, right. you know, at which point it's over, there's nothing more, it's finished, you know, there's no fascination in it anymore for me, I would never pick it up and read it again, you know, and so I, because, you know, um, that the book has been republished, I went back and read it and I hadn't read it in 10 years. And it was so revealing to me, you know, about who I was when I was writing that book 10 years ago and who I wanted to be, you know, um, the character of Ruth Thomas who's just like this smart ass and tough and kind of, you know, like sarcastic and, and, and undefeatable and, you know, all the stuff that I, I, I wanted to be perceived as mm-hmm. at that age. You know, now I look at it and I just think, oh, <laughs> kid. Well, you, you talk about how, you know, since yeah. you pray love, you've learned to not rush through the yellow lights of, yeah. of the intersections or of yeah, life, right? Yeah, I work on that, yeah. Uh, so could you write that book now? No, I don't think so. I don't think I could write Eat, Pray, Love now. Um, I don't think you could, you know, at any given point in your life go back and, and recreate the emotional and, and sort of psychological state that you were in at that time that would mm-hmm. lead you to be fascinated by those particular questions. Um, and and even the humor um, that shows up in, in various different books of mine changes over the years, like what I think is funny or what I think is important. I want to I want to talk about Sternman, but one, another question occurs to me. Do you feel sort of restricted by the success of Eat, Pray, Love? Yes and no. Right. I mean, you're yeah, unlimited and, and limited yeah, at the yeah, same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question, you know. Um, it's... Uh, on one hand, as a self-supporting female creative person, it has been a boon beyond imagination to not have to live from paycheck to paycheck anymore, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that opens up my life in ways and re- relieves this burden of pressure that I've had forever because I didn't take a conventional career and I've always been had to sort of get by on my own wits, you know, so this has been, you know, I, uh, fantastically relieving. You know? um, on the other hand, I had a lot of trouble kind of getting started on the book after Eat, Pray, Love because I couldn't find the right voice. I was so uh, sort of stuck in this weird place where I didn't want to dis- disregard um, the the people who love that book so much um, and who might be wanting more of the Have same. Have expectations, right. You know, and, and, and I sort of want to honor and respect those people. I don't want to say that, that, that how, you know, like uh, it, they matter to me, you know. On the other hand, I don't think in those same terms anymore. That was five years ago. I'm not thinking about those same issues. I'm working on other things. And so I really had to kind of take a long break and, and then come back and empower myself to just say, just write the book. Do what you always do. Write the book you need to write and then release it and let it be. And, and um, you've been able to release it, since then. I mean, you're writing well Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. And I just finished the book a couple of weeks ago um, and I'm really happy with it. But I did need a long period of sort of separation, like to almost forget that I was the person who wrote Eat, Pray, right. Love. We're jumping back and forth, but let's go back now to you as a magazine writer, a yeah. short story writer. Yeah. You're right. You want to get your short stories published and they say, 
okay, but we need a novel too. Yeah. You didn't want to write a novel. I didn't know if I could write a novel. You know, I never had any intention of being a novelist. I loved the, the form of short fiction, and that's what I've been writing since I was a teenager. And um, I had this collection of short stories. But as you know, you know, the publishing world isn't like, yay, unknown writers, small sure. literary <laughs> collection of, of right. obscure short stories. Yay, you know, the world is dying for more of these, you know. And so the deal that, that often gets made with young writers is, you know, we'll, we'll publish your short story collection, but you got to give us a novel. And, um, and I had no sense of whether I could ever write anything more than 20 pages long. Um, and so it was a, it was a challenge at, at that point. And someone just happened to have been talking to you about main lobster fisherman yeah the week before yeah actually the day before um <laughs> yeah i uh, i had a meeting at the publishing office um on a wednesday and on tuesday night i went out with my friend wade who grew up in maine and he had read my short stories many of which took place in the west um because i'd worked on a ranch in wyoming mm -hmm. after college and he said uh you know this whole cowboy thing is so overdone there's nothing new to say about cowboys interestingly annie Prue several years later wrote broke back mountain Turns apparently there, there was there right. was something <laughs> much more to say about cowboys but um Anyway, he said, if you're really interested in writing about hard-living, rough American individualists, you should go to Maine and write about lobster fishermen. And he mentioned this business about these territory wars that the fishermen get into. And it just seemed so, like, sort of South Pacific, this idea um, in the you know 20th century off the coast of the United States that there were these territorial, tiny little island domains fighting each other um, was fascinating to me. So the next day... At the meeting, um, I said, they said, do you want to write a novel? And I said, I've always been really fascinated with <laughs> lobster fishermen. <laughs> and uh, suddenly I was, <laughs> they took me up on it. And I'd been Maine like once in my life. And suddenly I have to write the definitive book on lobster fishing. And so then um, you go to Maine, you check it out. You've got your set. You've yeah. got your location. But you don't really have a story yet. No, the story was the last thing. You know, first of all, I went there and interviewed people and collected anecdotes and sort of got, you know, those pieces of story. But I didn't have an overwhelming story structure. And um, the main character's name is Ruth Tom and it occurred to me to go check out wh why I had chosen the name Ruth. And, and I read the book of Ruth again, and, and there's wonderful stuff in there about belongership and family and outsiders, and it, it sort of fit in with the island mentality. And then, um, and also um, Portrait of the Lady by, by Henry James, I had recently read that, and I wanted to kind of redeem Isabel Archer and create a female character who's sort of just as mighty and just as interesting and um, just as manipulated, but who ends up victorious. And when it comes to the manipulation, it's the Ellis family yeah. in this novel. Yeah. If, fascinating relationship with this Mr. Ellis. Tell me about him. Yeah, he's the patriarch of um, the island uh, that, that my character is from, and he's a, a rich granite magnate um, because the, these islands are rich in, in granite, and his family has been sort of exploiting the island over the last century or so. And Ruth's mother... Physically and emotionally. Physically and emotionally. And Ruth's mother was um, a sort of daughter-slash-slave adopted servant to this family um, who sort of escaped and married a lobster fisherman, much to the family's dismay, created Ruth, and then went back to the Ellis's. And so she's got a very tormented relationship with these people. The next novel's yeah. ready? Yeah, it's not a novel, actually. It's a memoir. It's a um, memoir, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a memoir. It's called Matrimonium, and it's a meditation on the subject of marriage. And is there trepidation as you wait for that to come out? Less than before I started writing it, you know. Um, I think my I, my trepidation was front loaded, um, you know. And then once I actually got through the book, um, I'm pretty happy with it at this point, you know. Set um, it free. Let it go, and it doesn't have to. I mean, if I was walking out there with an expectation that my books are now all going to sell five million copies, that that would be an ill-advised expectation. And you know, it's just um, Eat, Pray, Love is such an aberration, and and it, it was so great. But I think. You know, af after that, you just have to kind of go back and let things. Well, find who knows? Audience. We'll find out. Who knows, indeed? Elizabeth Gilbert, it was nice to talk to you. My pleasure. Thanks. I'm Steve Bertrand. This is Meet the Writers on BarnesandNoble.com.